Today's sermon is about how we are born again to a living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It's, it's this promise that the words that we have in Christ give us a living and abiding truth that will not perish, will not get defiled, will not fade. Because you see, words indicate a truth that cannot be just erased by something that I see. There are words that are powerful, like when God said, let there be light, and there was light. But there are other words besides the words of God that can change us. There are other words that can let us know he is with us, uh, to say, I love you, I care for you. But sometimes words can indicate a change that's not even about God, but they're still amazingly powerful. Think about the word, you're fired. That has a lot of power to indicate something. No matter how much stuff you see on your desk, now everything's changed. Or when a, a spouse comes up to the other one and says, I want a divorce, those words indicate a lot. No matter how many clothes you have in the dresser, or depending on how angry she is, maybe on the floor, I don't know. But, or if you've been trying out for a, a fall sport in August, going to the two-a-days, and and then suddenly you hear from the coach, you're on the team. Those words indicate something. I want you here. That indicates something about that true in my heart. You're not here right now, and I want you here. I want you here in the holy house of the Lord's habitation to dwell with me in the word of God. That's what's true in my heart. No matter what I see here, I know it's true. I want you here. First Peter includes some of these words that indicate the true and the lasting reality of God's providing word. Verse 3 from chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. What words did you hear in that sentence from 1 Peter chapter 1 that indicate a truth that might be different than what you see around you? Born again to a living hope. There are all sorts of things in this world that are perishing, that get defiled, that fade away. And if my hope were placed on those things, those things that I can easily see, I would feel like I was still dead. But Jesus gives us the confidence through his resurrection that we too are also born again. Peter gives us another one of these words that indicate a truth that might not always match up with what we see. He does this in verse 18. He says, you were ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers. Ransomed, bought out of. Like a lamb pure and undefiled, he was the sacrifice that paid the price for your sins. But sometimes when I look around, I can still feel like I'm in bondage to my fear, that I'm held in chains by my anger, that my sense of expectation of how I want people to do what I want right now can lead me to try to rely on the measures of me getting what I want. Peter even talks about how silver and gold can give us this sense of chase that we're getting somewhere, that we have freedom. Because I have enough silver and gold, I must not be in chains anymore. But he says, you've been ransomed from your futile ways received from your forefathers. Another verse that indicates a truth that's going to be different than what you see is found in verse 23. It says, since you were born again, not of perishable seeds, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Now this word that indicates is pretty similar to what we heard in verse 3 when he said you're born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But what he adds here is being born again not of perishable seeds, but of imperishable. He adds this metaphor of seeds. It lets me know that being born again is not just this static something that is not going to change, but it's kind of like this light switch. It's either on or off. But I'm born again, and I'm a seed. I'm a seed. I'm something that's going to grow. I'm something that's getting more vibrant, that's being filled with hope. 
And all this is happening through the living and abiding word of God. You are born again. You are born again through the living power of God's word. God's word is what makes us alive in creation. It's God's word that makes us alive in the promises of Jesus Christ. It is God's word that makes us alive in this church. The living and abiding word of God is that same word that was found in creation where he said, let there be light and there was light. The living and abiding word of God is that same word that was made flesh that dwelled for you upon the cross and rose again on the third day. This living and abiding word of God is the same word that we now share in this holy Christian church. What I've just shared with you, that consistency of the living, abiding word of God, that's the Apostles' Creed. In creation, it's the word. In redemption, it's the word. In your sanctification, it's the word. But the truth is, before the proclamation of this word of God arrives in your life, before you believe you are born again, that you've been ransomed out of your futile ways, before any of this is true in your life, you are dead. You are dead in your sins. You're dead in your rebelliousness against God's ways. You are unable to see and savor the promise of this word of God. This word that's been foreknown from the beginning that's now being revealed in these last days for us, has been hidden because of our sin. We've been unable to see it. We've been unable to know how to love one another in this word. You are dead. Now, Peter does an interesting construction here in how he frames chapter 1. He describes this truth that we're dead. We're dead in our sins and our trespasses. That we've been born again. That was verse 3 that I read. And then he goes on to describe how this is a living hope. A living hope that's built on the living Jesus. Because Jesus lives, we have a living hope. And this living hope doesn't perish. It doesn't get defiled. It's unfading. This new birth you have cannot die. And so don't be denied, don't be daunted by the suffering of this age because we live. We live not through our own strength. We don't live through what we have. We live because Christ lives. This living hope, it changes our lives. It changes our lives because we've been ransomed out of our futile ways. It changes our lives because we've been raised up with Jesus for life. It changes our lives because God has called us to live in this abiding word. I want to talk to you now a little bit more about this word ransomed. Ransomed is to be kidnapped, to be held in bondage. For us, that's our bondage to sin. That's our bondage to the futile way of trying to save and rescue ourselves through our own vanity of efforts. You can tell when someone is still ransomed to sin, I mean not ransomed to sin, still in bondage to sin and not yet ransomed out, when they are trying to save themselves through their own self-righteousness through their own standing higher and higher and higher on the pedestals of grandeur, they think that they're getting somewhere on their own. This is like the Tower of Babel, thinking that you can build something higher and higher and make a name known for yourselves. We live in bondage to this kind of sin. We try to rescue our lives, and we measure our rescue by having more and more gold or silver. But you see, there is an error in this vanity. And the error is, if you get just enough attempts, if you just try hard enough over and over again, enough redos, you will be able to break those chains yourself. It's a a groundhog movie kind of illustration. If you think that God shows you an example, a demonstration of this is what love looks like, and if you just try it hard enough, you'll get out of it. But you see, God doesn't ransom us so we can do it ourselves now. God ransoms us out of our futile ways that we've inherited from our forefathers because he knows it doesn't go anywhere. The movie Groundhog Day isn't life. It's not the reality that we live in. Although you may be feeling like you're in a scene of where every day is the same, and if you can just get a little better this day than you were yesterday... But some of you have already figured out 
that on 35th day, 39th day, you're not getting any better. You're still the sometimes grumpy, still sometimes joyous. Sometimes you don't know what day it is and what kind of person you're going to be. God has paid this ransom price once and for all through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He is not just a moral example. He's the one that breaks the chains and sets you free. God raised us from death to life through Jesus. You're not just ransomed to now go live in whatever way you want. You've been ransomed out of sin and you've been raised by Jesus to life. The Holy Spirit, he takes our dead spirits that have been chained by sin and now he lives and breathes in us. In these dying bodies, these failing and frustrating bodies, the Spirit comes and enlivens us in the Word of God. This living and abiding Word of God dwells in us. In union with Christ. In union with Him, we are born again. This is how Paul will describe it in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. As much as you have died with Christ in your baptism, you've drowned that old sinful self, you've put to death and broken the chains of that futile self, You've also now risen with Christ. And if you live with Christ, now you live with the promise of hope. You live with the joy of promise. That this day, where some bad things happen and some good things happen and you read the news and you're not sure is today different or is today the same, there's something that cuts through all of that and says, I live. And because I live, you live. God brings about this rebirth through the resurrection of Jesus. So we have been ransomed out of our self-righteousness. We've been ransomed out of death. And we've now been raised with Jesus for life. So ransomed from death, raised for life. And now God is calling us in this good news to have a living and abiding hope that is built on the foundation of the living and abiding word. Through the imperishable seed of God's word. That word that's proclaimed in the world by the power of the spirit. It's taking root in your life. This seed that is planted that is taking root is giving you a vision of the beauty of what your life can look like as you live in the promise of Jesus Christ. By faith, I want you to hold on to this vision of you growing into the beauty of the holiness of God. Because by sight, we're not going to know it. By sight, some days are not going to happen like this. We still are sinners. But the promise of Jesus Christ is the power of God to indicate a truth that your eyes may not always see. The word of God indicates a truth that then creates an imperative for our action. So think about the beginning of the sermon where I said some words indicate truth that may not be obvious right away, like you're on the team. If you've been doing the two-a-days and you think, am I really on the team yet? I don't have the jersey with my name on it. Am I on the team? Those words now indicate something, though. You're on the team. So now there's an imperative for you to act like you're on the team. What words are indicating truth for you are you are ransomed? out of your futile ways. You are ransomed into the promise of God's life and promise for you. So there's an imperative now to live no longer chained to sin and having to live in the vanity of getting more and more gold and silver and higher and higher on the pedestal. You have an imperative to love one another. What words are indicated in you are raised with Jesus from death to life? There's an imperative now to live no longer in the trudgery towards despair, but to now live in the vibrancy that's going in life in the kingdom of heaven. The words, you are called. What do those indicate? They indicate that you are no longer wandering in this aimless moat of despair. There's a hymn that has a verse like this. uses the word moat. We didn't sing that one today, though. What, is, what imperative does that give you? To know you are called. To know that you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, called out of darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim the excellences 
of him who has delivered you into this life and light. The word of God indicates a truth that now creates an imperative in our life. I want you to know, here's what I trust in every day. And I ask you to do the same. You've been ransomed from death. You've been raised for life. And now you are called to be a part of what God is doing. These are not days just like every other day. These are not groundhog moments where you're going to redo yourself into something better. These are the days when we must trust that you are ransomed. You are raised. You are called. May this be the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That will keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this day and each day. Amen.